This is Precious Buchu, Outreach and Operations Coordinator at the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. Also representing the Budget and Policy Center are Senior Budget Analyst Kim Justice, Senior Fiscal Analyst Andy Nicholas, and Policy Analyst Elena Hernandez. As you all likely know, we are a research organization dedicated to advancing the prosperity of all Washingtonians. We've been hosting these calls throughout the legislative session, and today we're excited to provide what will likely be our final budget beat of this session, unless something especially monumental happens in these final days of session. A few quick housekeeping notes. We have muted all lines to avoid background noise. If you have questions for us, please send them to us using the chat function on ReadyTalk. We will respond to as many as we can during the last few minutes of the call. We are recording this discussion and it will be posted to our website soon. So today, our team will be highlighting some of the hits and misses of the 2015 session and budget. Given the intense legislative session we've had, there's obviously a lot to cover which means we're going to launch right in. So, Kim Justice is going to start by reminding listeners about some of the context that surrounded this year's session when it kicked off back in January. Kim, it's all yours. Thanks, Precious. Hello, everyone. So just to start with some background and context that helped frame the budget discussions going into the 2015 session, um, let's start with McCleary. Uh, in September of 2014, the state Supreme Court ruled the state in contempt in the McCleary case, which as you all know is the case in which the Supreme Court found that the state is not meeting its paramount duty to amply fund basic education. More specifically, that contempt ruling relates to the state's failure to comply with the court's order to provide a complete plan on how it would fully fund basic education by the 2017-18 school year. So the court gave the state until the end of the 2015 session to comply and to purge that contempt ruling, otherwise it would issue sanctions. In yet another Supreme Court ruling uh, that came out last summer, the court found that the state had violated the Constitution by <coughs> temporarily holding patients in need of mental health treatment in hospital emergency rooms. This practice, known as psychiatric boarding, had been occurring because there simply was not enough capacity in the mental health system to serve those in need of treatment, and no doubt uh, part of the problem was uh, budget cuts that had happened in previous years. So this ruling meant that lawmakers would need to increase funding in order to provide additional space in mental health treatment facilities. Yet another issue that framed the budget debates was Initiative 1351, which passed in November of 2014. This initiative calls for lower class sizes beyond what the state had already passed as part of its basic education reform. So it called for lower class sizes in, in grades uh, 4 through 12 and increased the number of school staff, such as nurses, librarians, principals, and groundskeepers. The cost to implement the initiative was tagged at $2 billion in this budget cycle and an additional $2.7 billion in the 2017-19 biennium. And as well, this uh, past fall, um, public workers and the governor agreed to compensation and benefit increases through the collective bargaining process. So those agreements are passed on to the legislature for either approval or rejection and were estimated at about a half a billion dollar cost for uh, the 2015-17 budget cycle. So these factors taken together along with the increased cost just to maintain all the services that the state is currently providing resulted in a sizable revenue shortfall of about four billion dollars at the start of session. So it's easy to see why uh, the biggest debate of the 2015 session centered around raising revenue. And I'm going to turn it over to Andy Nicholas to talk more about that. Then we'll come back to the budget and I'll talk about how the legislature addressed these big spending issues among other items. Over to you, Andy. Thanks, Kim. 
So given that we faced a relatively uh, large budget shortfall at the beginning of this year, and given that many lawmakers in our state uh, did not want to resolve that shortfall by uh, enacting devastating cuts to health care, child care, and a range of other services that had already weathered a number of cuts throughout the Great Recession, uh, policymakers looked to uh, fill that gap and to make our next down payment on the McCleary mandate with a variety of revenue options. And this next slide that you're going to see is simply a table of the options that were put forward by the governor and legislative leaders in terms of uh, addressing our flawed state tax system. Um, so start off with the governor. Late last year, um, Governor Inslee came out with what we called a bold proposal to reform our state tax system. At a high level, his revenue proposal included uh, a new capital gains tax, which is something that we have been promoting for a number of years and we're very excited to see. Uh, he proposed to tax capital gains above $50,000 a year for a married couple or $25,000 a year for single filers at a rate of 5%. Um, he also proposed to close a number of tax breaks um, to uh, put a fee on carbon pollution and several other efforts altogether his proposals would have generated about $1.4 billion per biennium in additional resources primarily to help fund education per the McCleary Agreement. Now his proposal framed the debate around revenue moving into session. The, the proposal subsequently put forward by leaders in the State House of Representatives also included a capital gains tax. However, theirs was a slightly lower 5% tax rate. Um, they also proposed to close seven wasteful tax breaks to reform our business tax system by reestablishing a surcharge on uh, service industry businesses, um, including accountants, lawyers, engineers, uh, and a range of other professional and business services. Um, however, to ensure that the smallest of businesses uh, would not would not face a difficult tax increase, they uh, roughly doubled our small business tax credit to offset costs for the, the lowest uh, or the smallest business businesses in our state. Altogether, house revenue proposals would have totaled about $1.5 billion per biennium going forward. So we had two significant bold proposals on, on making really good progress uh, to reform our flawed state tax system. However, um, those of you that are looking at the Senate column may see a slightly different trend. While you saw a number of proposals for increasing revenues in a, uh, an equitable and responsible way, Senate leaders actually had the no conference has been muted. The Senate leaders had actually uh, no significant revenue proposals. Uh, and in fact had introduced about $115 million per biennium in new or renewed tax breaks, which would have reduced total resources. So that was sort of the beginning of the session. Uh, how did things end up? Well, as the session evolved, the economy continued to rebound and we got more favorable revenue forecasts. Which, uh, which served to, at least on paper, narrow the, the, what would be needed in terms of balancing the state budget in the near term. Um, and you also had a Senate that was very resistant to uh, enacting any substantial new revenue resources to support our new uh, needed commitments to education. So what we actually wound up with uh, in what was recently enacted was about $220 million in revenue-related actions, um, but uh, uh, only a, small, a smaller portion of those actually resulted in new ongoing tax increase resources to support education. So of that $217 million, we had a, about $162 million in tax break reductions or eliminations. Those were primarily focused on the high tech industry, uh, Microsoft in particular, a sales tax exemption that they claim on um, equipment and materials they use to develop software was uh, removed. The bill was interesting in that it, it specifically targeted 
uh, Microsoft to reduce that uh, particular exemption. They also uh, uh, got, li got rid of a preferential B&O or business and occupation tax rate on royalty income uh, of which Microsoft and other high-tech businesses in our state are large beneficiaries. Um, that particular preference originated back in the 1990s when it became apparent that Microsoft was and other businesses were reporting large amounts of what ought to have been taxable income in a Nevada subsidiary. In 2010, the legislature closed that loophole but changed it so that Microsoft only had to pay royalty income on, on actions that occurred within Washington State. So if Microsoft sold a license to a, pro, to a company that did not have a presence in Washington, uh, it would not have to pay B&O taxes on those. Meanwhile, they were still getting the preferential rate. So what they agreed to this year was to apply the same rate for uh, royalty income um, that other service businesses pay, which is 1.5%, um, and they would still only apply to activity that occurs within Washington State. And then the major portion of the revenue tax increase package were, or not the major, but a major, was changes in so-called nexus laws, which are about establishing a connection to Washington State and what business taxpayers owe. So um, many of you know that nationwide sales tax collections have been declining because of online sales. Uh, uh, leaders took a bold step this year in trying to narrow that here in Washington State by saying if a business in Washington State has an ad on their website that links to, say, Overstock.com, that Overstock is going to have to collect and remit sales tax taxes on those purchases. And they also changed uh, rules for out-of-state wholesalers that do significant activity in Washington State. They were able to avoid business and occupation taxes. Now they will owe business and occupation taxes if they have a significant amount of business in Washington State. So we got about $162 million in tax break reductions, but about $40 million of that was offset by new or extended tax breaks. And those include sales tax exemptions for data centers or server farms, uh, uh, B&O tax exemptions for meat packers and dairy and vegetable processors, um, aluminum smelters, and uh, several others. And then finally, we got about $91 million in what can best be called as administrative actions. And these are things that don't change a taxpayer's particular liability, but that wind up generating revenue, for example, from uh, unclaimed lottery prizes or unclaimed property reported to the Department of Revenue, increases in late fees and penalties for uh, businesses that are late on paying their taxes and similar activities. So when you net it all out and you just look at the sort of new ongoing revenue streams to support public services going forward from tax increases, we have about $130 million in revenue increases that were enacted compared to about $1.5 billion that were proposed at the beginning of the session. And with that, I will hand it back to Kim. Thanks, Andy. Um, so in addition to those uh, pretty minor revenue actions that Andy just talked about, uh, lawmakers also balanced the budget by relying on transfers from other accounts. Uh, they used a positive funding balance that was carried over from the last budget cycle. Um, we had some positive growth in uh, revenue projections, and we also were helped out by some additional federal funding. So those components um, make up the, the solutions to how the lawmakers uh, address the budget. Now, most of uh, the, the new investments that were made uh, went to education, and I'm going to walk through those uh, starting with early learning. In early learning, we saw a historic investment of $158 million. This investment nearly doubles the state in, state's investment in early learning. The funding uh, goes to support the Early Start Act, which builds on our quality rating and improvement system. It requires early learning providers who receive state funds to participate in the rating system and also set standards for quality for those providers. The funding also supports uh, 1,600 additional preschool slots and allows families receiving Working Connections childcare 
to be eligible for a 12-month period, which is important in helping families avoid disruptions to care when they face job changes or changes in their income. In K through 12, we saw an additional $1.3 billion investment in basic education, and those investment, that investment covers um, the next phase in for lowering class sizes in kindergarten through third grade. Ultimately, where we will get is to 17 students per class um, in kindergarten through third grade. The funding also supports um, full implementation of all-day kindergarten um, in all schools by the 2016-17 school year. And it provides full funding for maintenance, supplies, and operating costs, um, which was statutorily required, so it was included in, in what's considered part of the maintenance level budget. In addition to those investments in basic education, uh, lawmakers also increased teacher pay. They did that by funding the cost of living adjustment that's required under Initiative 732, and then they added an additional investment to um, allow teachers to receive pay increases that were equal to what state employees receive through their collective bargaining agreements. On Initiative 1351, uh, which I mentioned earlier, had a $2 billion price tag for the next two years. Uh, that was not funded in the final budget. And um, just uh, yesterday, legislation to delay implementation of that initiative by four years finally cleared the Senate after hitting some bumps. So lawmakers plan to begin funding that initiative in the 2019-21 biennium. Um, levy reform um, is another issue uh, related to funding basic education, and it's considered to be an important piece of complying with the court's order to amply fund basic education. At issue is that currently schools supplement state funding with local levy funds in order to cover the cost of basic education. But because it's explicitly the state's responsibility to pay for basic education, the state needs to cover that full cost. We saw a flurry of proposals released late in the regularly scheduled session um, that attempted to address this issue, but it's a big and very complex issue and no agreements were reached on how to solve it this year. Um, in higher education, um, Washington is getting noticed across the country for lowering college tuition. Um, the legislation that passed calls for a 5% tuition reduction at all public colleges and universities in the 2015-16 school year. And then in the 16-17 school year, there would be an additional 10% reduction at the University of Washington and Washington State University. For regional universities, including the Evergreen State College and applied baccalaureate programs at community colleges, tuition would be lowered an additional 15% in the second school year. In future years, tuition increases are tied to increases in the median hourly wage. Now, while lowering tuition will make college more affordable for many middle-income families, it's the students with lower incomes that face the biggest hurdles to college. For those students, financial aid is really the make or break factor for attending college. And unfortunately, lawmakers missed an opportunity this year to increase funding for the state need grant, which is our uh, primary tool for uh, providing fi financial aid to students in need. Um, and there's currently over about 30,000 students who qualify for the state need grant but can't access aid because we don't have sufficient funding. So again, this was um, a missed opportunity in, in addressing the affordability of college. Some other notable budget actions um, outside of education. Um, we saw a $100 million increase in overall funding for mental health services, which is important in addressing the, the court case that I mentioned earlier. Um, there was a 9% increase to cash assistance uh, received by um, families on temporary assistance uh, for needy families, and this represents a partial restoration of a previous cut to, to cash assistance. Uh, we also saw full restoration of food assistance for immigrant um, families that was previously cut, and we saw full funding for the collective 
bargaining agreement that we talked about earlier. So these are all really great investments that help put our state on a strong path towards progress. But the biggest downfall of the budget is that it lacks additional long-term stable revenue. So in this graph, we're kind of putting together the pieces of what Andy talked about with revenue actions and the new investments that the state made, which are uh, largely in education. And what you can see is that tax, that you can see tax increases in contrast to new spending in education. And this paints a pretty clear picture that new revenue is inadequate compared to our new investments. Only $1 of revenue is raised for every $17 of new education investments. So the problem with this dynamic is that it makes our investments shaky in the long run and more susceptible to shifts in the economy. So without new, new sources of stable revenue, we're likely to be facing the same kind of budget challenges in two years from now. Thank you, Kim. Now, Elena Hernandez is going to discuss a few of the legislative hits and misses from this session. Thank you, Presha. So we just have the hottest June on record, and we're already seeing forest fires crop up in different parts of our state. This really drives home the fact that the effects of climate change are not something that will just impact future generations. It's something that's impacting us now, and a problem we can't afford to ignore. Policymakers had an opportunity to put Washington at the forefront of this issue with the Carbon Pollution Accountability Act this session. This bill would have put a price on carbon emissions and invested in communities hardest hit by pollution, including communities of color and people with low incomes. While this bill didn't pass this session, we do expect that the debate around this policy will continue in 2016. We also saw several efforts to advance racial equity through policymaking this session, and we think the state budget is a great tool to provide shared prosperity for all Washingtonians, regardless of race, place, gender, or economic status. However, there's also a need for legislation to address inequity, similar to two proposals that we saw this session from Senator Jayapal and Senator Hasegawa. These two bills aim to advance racial equity and social justice in policymaking by implementing racial equity impact analysis for bills relating to education and criminal justice, respectively. And while these bills didn't pass, they are part of a larger conversation about the importance of advancing racial equity through policymaking in our state. And finally, we saw a great deal of interest in the state minimum wage, the minimum wage bill this year, which would have increased the state minimum wage to $12 uh, per hour, passed out of the House, which is farther than it's gotten in previous years, and had a great hearing in the Senate. And uh, while it didn't result in a policy win, again, there's significant support building for this policy across our state, and we do anticipate seeing it uh, again in 2016. Great. Thank you, Elena. With session closing as we speak, we know many of you are wondering whether there are other big things on the horizon we should pay attention to. Andy Nicholas and Kim Justice will share thoughts on that. Thanks, Precious. Uh, the big thing that is on the horizon that could impact the state budget going forward is Initiative 1366, which is the latest proposal from Tim Iman. Um, any day now, it will very likely be uh, um, approved by the Secretary of State, showing that he has indeed collected enough signatures for it to appear on the November ballot. And the best way that I think you can describe this is a uh, supermajority via blackmail. What it is is Iman's latest effort to bring the so-called supermajority law back to life. What the supermajority law said was that any tax increase, which includes getting rid of a tax break, would require a two-thirds vote or supermajority vote of the legislature or a vote of the people. Um, and this law was struck down by the state Supreme Court back in 2012 as being a clear violation of our state constitution. Now, it's important to note that you cannot uh, amend the state constitution via initiative in Washington state. So what Iman is attempting to do with this initiative is to say, if the legislature does not 
put, does not pass a constitutional amendment for a supermajority vote by next April, April 15th to be precise, then the state sales tax rate will be reduced by one percentage point from 6.5% to 5.5%. Now, if this blackmail succeeds, that's a big problem. In other words, the legislature fearing with the implications of the sales tax cut uh, manages to get a two-thirds vote within their body to put a constitutional amendment on the 2016 ballot, um, then we wind up with a damaging supermajority law. And we've written a lot about the problems associated with these laws over the years, but the basic reality of them is that they put control of the state budget in a minority, a, a tiny number of uh, legislators' hands um, who can block any action to raise a tax or increase a tax break. And that's just bad for our state democracy, and we have a pretty good lesson about how uh, it works, that during much of the Great Recession, our hands were effectively tied because of these laws, and as a result, our, uh, we experienced deep cuts to things that people care about and cuts that probably prolonged the, our economic recovery and made and put uh, uh, a number of vulnerable Washingtonians uh, at, uh, at a worse position than they otherwise needed to be had we been able to make reasonable changes to our state tax system. If it doesn't work, and two-thirds, which is ne never easy to get, of legislators can't agree to put this on the ballot, then we see about $1.4 billion per year in resources that support the everything from K through 12 education to higher education to work supports to public safety. All of those things get uh, reduced by $1.4 billion uh, going forward because of the sales tax uh, sort of gun to the head that he's moved in, uh, that he has built into this particular initiative. So this would be a huge disaster for Washington State if it winds up being approved by voters on the ballot, and we will certainly be working with partners across the state on getting the message out about uh, how much of a, a problem this initiative is and uh, why voters should reject it. All right, one of the issues that I wanted to bring up was the fact that um, the state is currently still in contempt of court. Um, and this also gets to a question we just got from one of the listeners, which is, you know, I just went through the investments that were made in K through 12, and I think a lot of people are wondering, so is this gonna satisfy what the court wants? Um, and as a reminder, the court gave the legislature until the end of 2015 to uh, a 2015 session to purge its contempt ruling. Session is um, literally ending today, um, I think probably right now as we speak. So one thing we should expect is to see um, <clears throat> the Article 9 Legislative Committee, which is the committee that acts as the conduit for communication between the state and the court. We should expect them to, see, to put together a report to the court um, regarding the budget actions that were taken. So um, that would be one thing to look out for. How the court will respond to that is really anybody's guess, um, but a couple things, kind of questions, I guess, to keep in mind around that is, um, you know, I think one thing that the court will be looking at is the investments that were made, the $1.3 billion to phase in lower class sizes, all day kindergarten, and um, funding the maintenance and operation of schools. Um, does that funding in and of itself serve as a plan for fully funding basic education? Because we have just one biennium left to make that full payment. So um, I think there's uh, perhaps some thought among some legislators that that investment in and of itself serves as a plan um, that the state is poised to fully fund basic education by its deadline. Um, another issue that will um, be you know looking to see how the court responds to is levy reform. Again, I mentioned that the legislature did not address this this year. Um, how the court will respond to that um, will be another thing to to look out for. And then finally, um, how the court will view the delay of Initiative 1351. Um, and that and that's important because Initiative 1351. Um, the requirements of that initiative are now part of the program of basic education. 
And the court has said previously that uh, the program of basic education cannot be cut um, unless there's a valid pol policy reason for doing so. And so I think that's another element of how the court um, reacts to uh, the state budget um, that will be interesting to look out for. We'd now like to take questions from our listeners. Um, if you have submitted a question already through the chat line, we'll get to as many of those as we can first. If you have not, please feel free to send us a question and we'll do our best to get it, get to it in the remaining time we have. If we don't get to your question, please email me at preciousb at budgetandpolicy.org and I'll refer your questions to our experts accordingly. All right, here's one question that we have. Were there any cuts in this budget? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we look at this budget across the board, um, overall, um, you know, I, I characterize it as maintaining the status quo in many areas, and then also, again, investing most in, in education. Um, but that said, there were also some cuts that were made. Um, in particular, there, were, there was about $50 million um, cut from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. So on the one hand, while it was great progress to see lawmakers increase cash assistance for those families, uh, there was also a pretty significant cut to the program overall. Um, and this, again, is a um, program that has been cut pretty severely over the last two years. So um, what we really need to see is reinvestment in that program, not further cuts. Um, another thing that was cut was, um, and, and was fully eliminated actually, was um, uh, assistance for people with lower incomes having access to telephone and voicemail services. Um, so that was another cut in the budget. Um, aside from that, there's, you know, there were definitely um, requests and um, things funded in the governor's budget that did not make it into the final budget. Okay, um, that's it for questions. We need to sign off now. One thing I'd like to remind you of is that you can find our progress index at budgetandpolicy.org. If you haven't taken a look at it yet, this report provides many recommendations for how we can all take steps to ensure that Washington State and its people are making progress. We hope you'll check it out. Thank you all for joining us today and many thanks again to Kim, Andy, and Elena. Stay tuned to our website for a recording of this call. And after you sign off, a survey will pop up on your screen and we'd really appreciate if you'd give feedback. Thanks again for participating and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Please stand by.